think of something broad, like what, like uh, deliver, deliver Amazon, or <laughs> uh... what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the Linux Lads, the only Linux podcast that casts a shadow. Um, today in the studio, which is not actually a studio, but each of our houses, um, I'm Shane. I'm Connor. And I am Mike. Yes, yes you are. And uh... <laughs> oh, Thanks God. for the confirmation, I was waiting for it. <laughs> so yeah, it's Wednesday night, we're all a bit giddy. Let's Let's, let's do this. Um, so before we get into it, uh, we just want to give our ad read today to, uh, the document foundation Um, they're the maintainers of uh, LibreOffice. It's a free and open source alternative to the likes of Microsoft office and Google docs. Um, as we probably all know, it's a landing long standing project as it is a direct continuation of the open office and the star office projects that you might have recognized from quite a while ago. Um, they also maintain the open document formats themselves, which are an important open standard alternative to uh, MS Office formats. So uh, please show your support by going to libreoffice.org forward slash donate. So stories um, from the last two weeks. Um, or thereabouts. Or thereabouts. Uh, me, Shane, that's my name, right? Uh, <laughs> I made a, a lope. I made a low poly tux in Blender, which was fun. Um, because I wanted to sit down. I said I just sat my ass down and I said, "Right, you're gonna actually, you're not gonna mess around with something really complicated. You're gonna sit down and you're just gonna do a small project, and just get it done in like half an hour to an hour, and just do something simple. And that's what I did. It's like a cool little stylized poly polygonal tux kind of thing with some mood lighting and whatnot so <laughs> so uh we'll link to it in the show notes but um yeah i enjoyed it like and i kind of encourage people if they want to learn blender or any kind of complex program to try doing it that way try to like a little project just learn enough to do the basics and then move on keep completing small things so especially for me um but yeah mike that's my name uh i've been playing with ansible which is a clever utility to orchestra or to manage uh linux installs and uh you know so you can it can do a lot of stuff like if you if you run virtual machines or if you if you have some servers running somewhere you can execute scripts uh that will like change configuration uh run some commands uh it's clever in a way that it's uh, what they called Idempotent or something. Basically, if you run it twice, it and the desired effect has already happened at the first time. The second run will just not change anything, which is really, if you think about it, it's really, uh, and uh, that's a really important thing. But yeah, I've been I've been not doing anything important. With it. I've been just trying to uh, use it to start some servers. And uh, at work, I had a little server that will that uh, I have a little. Uh, script that uh, uh, creates a git repo for me on on a remote machine and then it syncs to my uh, laptop so that I have everything uh, syncs over git. Anyway, not very interesting, but it's really fun if you play with it. Well, it is a Linux podcast, so (laughs) it's a bit interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not really interesting the way I talk about it, but uh, yeah, if you if you really, I, I, there will be obviously a note in the show notes, and uh, it's it's uh, cleverly to utility that can do a lot. Well, I say little. It's a massive project, to be honest. I think it's actually made by Red Hat, um, but uh, it can do a lot of things that makes people's lives easier. What? That's uh, I, this is a bit of a tangent. Sorry, but the 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 word Ansible. I remember reading that in. Uh... I think it was a Star Trek D Space Nine novelization or some shit that I read when I was 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they, as long they, as it they, wasn't Ansible and Gretel. No, they were, <laughs> they were talking about subspace communications, like how they work. And they talked about Ansible particles or I don't know, it's partly like, I don't know, like fucking quantum physics now. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's like how two particles can kind of vibrate at the same frequency, even though they're like light years apart and shit like I don't know. I, I'd like that stuff. 
But uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that's where I heard that word last time. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's interesting as well. Is that what the technology, that, that's what it does basically? Well, it, yeah, kind of. So according to Wikipedia, Ansible is a category of fictional device or technology capable of near instantaneous or superluminal communication, right? This is more like you you communicate with your with your other installs, and it's actually quite fast. We don't say superluminal, but uh, like it's not it's not FTL or anything. But uh, it's it is it is uh, fast. And what what's so cool about it? Like if you figure out how to how to put together a script that uh, will, for example, uh, start some containers, create them if they don't exist, uh, so that you have a so that you can. Without from scratch and using only Ansible, you can pretty much create a digital ocean droplet, install some container with some applications on it, and do it over and over and over again. So if you are messing with developing or installing something, it doesn't work for you once, you destroy it, and uh, and start again with with this. So and by the way, shout out to. I think Camilla from Dublin Linux who uh, pointed me in the direction of Ansible. I think Shane, the, um, what you were talking about there in physics is called quantum entang- entanglement, where uh, two two it, particles yeah. react the same way despite having huge vast distances between them. So, I think it's called quantum entanglement. Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have to splice. I would love to splice in the Homer Simpson nerd. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a copyright strike, though, because Disney owns that now. So, That's not be- yeah, true. Oh yeah, Fox. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we can't publish on YouTube. Um, so, uh, one thing before we move on to the news, it's vaguely Star Trek related. Star Trek Picard. What the fuck is going on in that show? I've yet to like see it. it, so I like it. I don't. Uh, it's weird. I don't understand what's happening at all. <laughs> like, why do they do any of the things they're doing in the show? It makes no fucking sense. Okay, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm much of a much simpler mind, so I, mean, I, this, I kind of like watching it. I'm on the second episode anyway. I'll see. Yeah, I'll give too. it. I'll give it the season. You know, but fuck, I just I don't know what's happening. <laughs> it's so it's so weird. I mean, it's shaping up better than Discovery did. I didn't actually see the second season of Discovery, if there was a second season. It's written no, by... Don't... It's almost like it's written by someone who, like, doesn't know how things they write on the page will actually appear in real life. Like, what a waste of Patrick Stewart, fuck's sake. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> I, I, I can't comment. I genuinely haven't seen it yet, but uh, I believe it's it, it's it's definitely like blockbuster like really big hype behind it so i just haven't got around to seeing it yeah but it was not even blockbusters like at times it's just random and weird like <laughs> um but anyway the news um so connor uh you put this one in uh pine 64 showed off new hardware cases and os's at fosdem so one of one of which you were you particularly like the name of the Hard Rock sixty four. I I tweeted out uh, using our, our our Twitter account saying for those about to Hard Rock we salute you. Uh, uh, if you get that reference, uh, we will be very much friends over a couple of points. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so the Hard Rock sixty four is essentially it's a a single board computer that uh, it's the same system on a chip that is in their uh, Rock 64 Pro I believe um except it's in a smaller form factor so it doesn't have the all the extra um bits that's on that that on that board so it's more raspberry pi sized roughly um but with a more powerful C- um, CPU or system on a chip on the top of it. Um, and they seem to be showing off a, 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 a range of prices starting off, depending on the amount of RAM that you want. You want. Wonder where they got that idea from. But <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but even even if it's, even if, if, if they're inspired by, um, so yeah, even if they're inspired by Raspberry Pi with their pricing structure, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I mean, um, more competition as far as I'm concerned. And it's really exciting hardware in terms of more, a much more powerful system on a chip on, on a smaller form factor. You can imagine, because the the 
the Pine 64, just not even the, the Rock 64, but just the regular Pine 64 and just then the Rock Pro 64, they're, they're larger boards physically. So you can imagine something with a smaller board would be you'd be able to fit it in in, in much more convenient er- areas. I mean, that's the reason why the uh, Pi Zero is so popular because it's literally so small that you could f- freaking attach it to uh, a weather station or something like that. And, and like, it, like once you make things smaller, then you make things more convenient to use. So something with a smaller board with a, a more powerful chip, you can definitely see the use case for I'm looking at the specs. Uh, obviously, they are very similar to the original uh, Rock. Uh, was it the Rock? Uh, uh, rock, rock, Pro. rock Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, minus the whatever PCI slots or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I like the fact that this is uh, two USB threes, eMMC storage, which uh, is uh, better than SD card uh, for for storage. Uh, has got an IR receiver, GPIO, obviously. And this can be, this looks like a lot of really cool projects could be started uh, with this little thing. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, for props for props to Pan64 for keeping on going and uh, uh, enriching the ecosystem. Yeah, the, it's a good thing the community or these companies aren't vindictive because it looks very similar to a Raspberry Pi. Um, well, there's it. Apart from the, 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 diagonal chip i think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that looks very similar to raspberry pi but they i don't think they can um i don't think they can uh, what do you call like uh copyright the form factor it's a system on it it's a it's a system on a chip on a bare bone board without freaking making the board bright pink I mean how are you going to differentiate true but the overall shape and where where all the the ports are placed is very similar yeah, or whatever, it's like it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. I wonder if it's compatible. If you can like reuse shields from Raspberry Pi on this device, uh, and if if there if there are some, I mean, uh, do you mean like heat sinks or something like that? Probably no heat sink. Probably no, because this chip is as uh, Shane said, it's it's uh, it's standing on its edge, right? It's diagonal. Whereas I think the he the the uh the chip on the raspberry pi i think is aligned with the sides of the of the board so i think uh th- but what i think you know the, the the different shields like for displays for piano keyboards or whatever whatever little things uh, uh, there's a millions of little things that you can put on top of a raspberry pi connect slide it onto the tops of the gpio pins and to turn it into like literally anything from piano to a security camera to uh, to i don't know my imagination doesn't reach as far as the marketplace does for this so uh yeah i wonder if so, it's compatible to this so for our listeners out there what they're describing is that the the chip is that on a 90 degree rotation versus the the uh kind of uh straight chip that's on the raspberry pi it's okay they have the internet they they know <laughs> it's they'll, gonna be in the show notes anyway, to... so that we can. Yeah, <laughs> it's standing on its edge. It's yeah, it's like hipster system on a chip. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's it's a kind of a it's not a yield sign, is it? Or it is a yield sign. I should know. I'm bloody not a driver. It's like uh, although actually the underside of the board is very interesting looking. Like that's a very you could or- say it's edgy. Uh, <laughs> The, like even like the way the the circuitry is laid out on the other side of the board is is it doesn't look like your typical board that I've seen recently. Like it's very organic. It's not very like linear. I don't know. It's a small thing, but I don't know. It just looks kind of cool. Like. <laughs> it's life jumping as we know it. <laughs> but it does. It, like you expect straight lines, and you know, on a PCB, but like that's. I don't know. That's all curvy and w- wobbly and shit. Time <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about this because somebody knows what I'm on about. <laughs> somebody does. <laughs> somebody gets me. Anyway, it's, it's a wibbly, um, wobbly, wobbly wonder. In another, in another episode of Pictures Over Radio. <laughs> <laughs> Pictures. Of... Oh God. 
Um, I, I, I look at I look at the small things. Okay. Um, where where are we going with this anyway? Next up, uh, oh yeah, the sh- the phone cases that they had at Fosdem, um, which is pretty exciting that they even have phone cases. No, th- this this is uh, great news because it just I it it was a bit of a uh, PR stunt in and, and I don't mean that in a in a bad way. It's the kind of the king of we're here and we're announcing for like for people who uh, it's kind of a reward is like for people who appeared at Fosdem and have ordered Pine phones. It's like by the way, hey guys, like we're thinking of you and we're we're like. We're providing cases to protect your your the phone you've just ordered kind of thing, and so yeah, it's 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 um it, it's a it's a good idea. It's been pre- people do like their phone cases. They like to to uh, protect their the phone that they've purchased, and one one somebody re- re- uh, one person in replied in the twitters saying um oh it's interesting but i don't see your logo on it and they they says i mean it's we don't want to to plaster it up with our logo it's your phone do what you want with it which i think is 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 a uh, quite commendable good guy pine Th- that was yeah the, that wasn't the only thing that the uh they were showing off was they were also showing off the various the latest uh, iterations of all the various uh, operating systems running on it, so your Ubuntu Touch and your Selfish OS and so on. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, common thread through all the stories and news that I've been reading recently, like the there's a real kind of ecosystem starting to spring up. Like we're we're seeing quite a lot of things. I mean, we take it for granted because it's been happening for a while now, but like going through all the things we're talking about today like it's crazy like there's so many developments like there's so much shit to be excited about i don't know is it just me no no it's not just you i mean uh i i was i was thinking that like if if this was like all of this stuff makes me genuinely excited i mean it's not just this it was the um uh, uh like call back to one of our previous episodes where we had Lucas on and he was talking about the Pine Time, which is their um their planned uh at some stage in the future they've no not set any kind of uh deadlines or anything like that, but a, an aspirational product that they have and um, is their their smartwatch. Um I'm like, okay, yeah, that shit sounds interesting. And the phone, that shit sounds interesting and the uh, Pine um Pinebrook Pro, that shit sounds interesting. And the Pine Tab, I mean, just like so many interesting products are coming out from them, and it's amazing that they're all coming from the same company. And it's even even more amazing that all of these are open platforms, and you can flash whatever whatever shit you want on it if if you're so inclined. Just like community developers, uh, knock knock yourselves out. I mean, hack away at this shit, do whatever you want. I mean, come up with with new things um running on this phone or on this smartwatch or anything that even we as the manufacturers of it didn't even think it was capable of doing. I mean, all that stuff is fucking really exciting. And it makes me think like I I would literally buy every single one of them for, uh thing from them and I like in the back of my mind is like well if you won the lotto maybe you could do it but the thing is they're so inexpensive that I wouldn't even have to win the lotto to buy all of their stuff because I genuinely want to buy all of their stuff yeah pretty much it, yeah it's like it's, it's like a few years back you couldn't get anything like this at all and now it's just like they're viciously throwing laptops at you like <laughs> oh, ah, stop um, Stop it, Pine! I don't want your damn laptop. <laughs> take, take it, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, that got dark. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, no, but yeah, it does feel like we're being like assaulted with with open hardware. It's 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 a good problem, though. I guess it is. Uh, next one up, uh, Regolith Desktop, uh, one point three released. Uh, makes using i3 even less scary reports oh my god ubuntu or omg ubuntu um i di- this this was very interesting to me and I, mike i think you in particular i knew you were maybe going to be a bit interested in this seeing as you put it in i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that is a dead giveaway isn't it uh, i'm using an uh, i3 on uh, on manjaro and it's 
amazing. I haven't tried Regolith yet, but what I like about it is uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's not just bad i3 on Ubuntu. It's uh, it has got uh, in GNOME is installed basically, and what that means. That I assume what it means because I, as I said, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, all the things uh, that you expect from a uh, from a full blown desktop environment, like for example, working Wi-Fi with a li with a little icon. Uh, volume control again with a little status icon and stuff like that is going to be provided by GNOME whilst uh, i3 is there on top of it and you can do your little tiling magic and work really efficiently which I think can be it's, it's something that's really missing from uh, from the from the lineup of possible Linux distributions because on one side you've got the, you've got the ones that give you by default everything but they often they they often are quite uh, either either kind of n not configurable very much by design not by mistake but just by design like you have your uh, you have your uh, gnomes and you have your uh, whatever other ones or you have the ones that are like for configurable like KDE but then again there's a lot of it and uh, it's KDE is massive and on the other hand you've got i3 which is great, but then if you install it just on bare on bare uh, on a bare install of Ubuntu or any other distro, you will have to set up yourself all of these things like Wi-Fi, applet, uh, you know, uh, uh, brightness, and all of this stuff, which can be quite a hard work. Uh, and I like that both Regolith and Manjaro kind of created this bridge in different ways because there's no GNOME on Manjaro, but uh, you know, they, they created this bridge where there is a in between. They still have got the good things of i3, but also you don't have to spend a day setting it all up so that you have a working install. So, like, I'm, I can't wait to have the time to try this. And, uh, the, you know, um, great, great, uh, I, great idea from, from the people who make it. Yeah, it does look uh, very interesting. Um i3 has has always interested me um but i've never i've just never had the enthusiasm to sit down and actually learn how to use it so uh, i don't know you know this is something i'd probably have a, a go at in, in in a virtual machine or something but uh as, just to see what it's like but but yeah it looks really good and more diversity on the desktop so it's it's great like because some people do genuinely prefer that way of working like the keyboard centric work workflow like it's like that's bloody ubiquitous <laughs> in, in the linux world so well it's you know everybody's different but i'm um, because you don't you kind of have something similar with the mac i guess but i haven't even though i haven't really tried a mac for a long time if i like Back in, back in the XP days when I was using uh, XP, you couldn't over well, Windows. What was the light? Was I think the last time that I really used Windows was either XP or Vista. You couldn't really do it. I don't know if it's possible with Windows, but I think Windows have got some tiling now coming into it, at least for, at least for developers. But Linux, because of the amount of choice there is, has got something for everyone, right? So. Uh, and I really like just using the keyboard and not having to, you know, I'm not, I'm no ninja with it or anything, but I just, I'll, but uh, not having to move my hand 20 centimeters to the right, that's an amazing improvement for me, for my lazy self. <laughs> um, next up, uh, I think we'll move on to uh, something Connor put in here. Uh, this, actually, I was having a look at these. These are crazy. Um, tuxedo computers. So uh, we're talking Manjaro and Kubuntu uh laptops basically like commercially available and they look they look very nice yes yeah, so it's banjaro and kubuntu have um uh teamed up with tuxedo computers and said uh tuxedo computers like you're a laptop laptop manufacturer like what if what if there was a manjaro edition or what if there was a kubuntu edition what did what would that look like in terms of uh design and things like that and um in in with the cl uh, calibration um uh tuxedo computers actually did like a kind of 
custom laser etching on the back so if the if uh if you buy the manjaro edition it would have um the tuxedo kind of with, with the manjaro logo mashup kind of le- uh, laser etched on the back and uh, same thing with um kubuntu focus you'd kind of have a kubuntu kind of laser etched thing going on as well it's it's really interesting and um from what I've heard, uh, Jason Evangelo, who who wrote the uh, one of the articles and in, in, we're going to put in the show notes here, he was he was saying when he was speaking to Tuxedo Computers that, uh, that, uh, like all all the customization can be done essentially. Like Tuxedo Computers will will be able to give you uh, a keyboard um, with kind of uh, cling on keycaps and everything that is like oh, cool. w- crazy amount of of um an elvish and things like that <laughs> like crazy amount of customizations obviously they know these, their audience <laughs> they very much know their audience but this you can imagine that this for people who who are basically touch typists i mean you can you can buy um keyboards with entirely blank screen blank um switches or blank keys because they're touch typists like they know what it is and they just prefer the clean look of it all being black or whatever and uh, needless to say and the the one that kind of has elvish script on it or whatever has klingon script on it um it's just because it looks cool uh, you won't be one of those hunt and peckers and go okay where's the Q key where's the N key <laughs> yeah what, what's what's the Klingon for L oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah there it is <laughs> uh, yeah obviously uh, for people who actually speak Klingon <laughs> of, of which I know there are people out there um, yeah what we said is basically good. we cannot speak Klingon <laughs> but, I think they know yeah, that uh, <laughs> I wish but, I could though. Uh, hopefully, what we said, what we our, our imitation of Klingon was not something grossly offensive, like uh, your mother's a whore or something. <laughs> <laughs> we apologise to all our Klingon listeners. <laughs> It's a Star uh, Trek heavy episode today, <laughs> um, but I uh, know it, it's really exciting to see these collaborations. Um, uh, there, there, it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a premium, but needless to say, these these are for uh, uh, very uh, specialized kind of hobbyist kind of things. I mean, if you can afford one of these computers, then all, all well for you. And of course, th- this level of customization comes at a price as well. So, uh, but it's 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 not extortionately expensive. It's not like it's a twenty grand laptop or something like this. It's it's just it's 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 an ever so slight premium over over um what you would normally pay for a laptop. But what what is that in euros? You know. <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at their website. I'm trying to figure out, but uh, no, it looks premium. Yeah. Oh no, it it looks like it's it's a very it's very premium product, and re- it, it it seems to be, but um, st- at least initially, um, it's going to be with a Intel Core i, wh- whatever you would like, um, uh, CPU, but I believe they're they're very much open to having AMD Ryzen in there as well. So that's that's good to have that kind of choice. Well, that's great because you can't get a decent Ryzen laptop to save your life these days, as far as I know. I mean, maybe it's changing. You know, these things change quite quickly. But... I've seen a few on the market. I was helping someone pick out a laptop the other day. And yeah, it's it's vast majority you'd see on Amazon or Intel. But no, Ryzen laptops are... But they're coming out like they're on the way. Yeah. I'm just looking. Is the is the Manjaro thing? Is it uh, the Manjaro laptop and the Focus? Are they built? Are they based on the Infinity, Infinity Book Pro 15? Do you know? Um, uh, do you not to... know the specific model? But I would imagine it's it's a pre-existing um, tuxedo computer model that um, have been customized for these um, special Manjaro and KD or uh, Kubuntu editions. I think I remember seeing somewhere, uh, somewhere the price tag for this, and if it was about for the Kubuntu Focus anyway, not the Manjaro one. I mean, the the Kubuntu one is a uh, is a beast, at least in this configuration that I'm looking for. There's no price either, but i7 uh, g uh, six gigabytes uh, GTX 2060, 32 gigabytes of RAM. There are a one terabyte nine seventy Evo. Yeah, that can't be cheap. Like that's um, 
I think uh, I've had this conversation with uh, Tad, uh, who was on our podcast before about this, and I was thinking, oh, come on, they can surely they can make it for for under 1200 euros and he was like no it's going to be about two grand and i think then i remember that he was right that um uh, they that the initial price for this was uh, around 2000 euros i think and then they then they slashed it down they changed the configuration slightly and made a basically cheaper model but i might be completely tripping and uh, making it up but um i think i seem to remember that uh it would be nice to confirm it but i don't know Next up, Epic gives Godot Game Engine a quarter of a million dollar grant. That is uh, pretty savage news, if you ask me, because uh, Godot Game Engine is an incredibly worthy project. Um, it is very well like specced as well. It's it does quite a lot of stuff. It's almost the equal of of Unity at this point. You know, it has its shortcomings, but like it's uh, I don't know. It's very complete. Uh, Mike, you put this in. Yeah, because it's uh, just like you, I believe that Godot is really worth it, and obviously Epic think uh, Epic thinks the same thing. Uh, they uh, they have a grant. I don't know how much is in the whole pot, but basically they do give money to open source projects like uh, Godot and before that Blender. Uh, so they obviously are choosing the product, the projects that they use in their own development, and it's a not only an important, uh, important. It's, this is not just the money, but it's also a massive endorsement that a major company like Epic uh, considers Godot an important project. So. Uh, you know, this is again. I, I whenever this happens, I'm always thinking, well, that's that's just. Even even without considering which project or 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 what kind of details, just the fact that you can make money you doing open source that's uh, that's basically heartwarming. Uh, you know there is a there is always a discussion about Epic being not very friendly to Linux or friendly to Linux because uh, on one side uh, their games don't uh, don't play on Linux uh, for. With who, everybody who are, who you ask has got an opinion about that, but uh, well, I'm happy that they that they at least support uh, good projects like Godot mm. Engine. I I mean I don't know much uh, about Epic or what they do or what they've done lately because I'm just not in the video game world anymore really. Um, uh, they they pulled. Um, this is actually news for fair. It happens about I think ten days ago. They announced that they'll be pulling. Um, support for online play of uh, rocket league uh, oh which is, yeah yeah uh, and uh i've never played it but i know a lot of people really enjoy playing it and the, the online multiplayer is the thing you play right yeah it's fun so yeah. they they have technical reasons for it i think uh some people say that they have uh, other motivation but uh, then like you if you if you listen to I think I've li- I've heard this uh, on multiple podcasts like uh, Linux Action News I think and others where they basically say they they said that according to Epic Linux and Mac together is I don't know 03 percent of their customers or something that basically doesn't move a needle so you kind of can't blame them at this point yeah, right? yeah I mean <laughs> you know, common it's... sense says like yeah don't dedicate um... resources to that. I, I, I just from the devil's advocate from the the um the technical point of view so their argument is that and take of this what you will if you're if feel free to call them lazy developers and just not bothering if you want but the the, the supposed technical reason behind it is because uh rocket league is using the unreal 3 engine and a, a, apparently like that doesn't support the newer that is supports open gl but i don't think it supports uh, vulcan and the newer technologies and i think their their next move is actually they want to move towards uh uh i think it's currently in directx 9 and i think they move want to move over to directx 10 which i think even though directx 11 is the latest one i think they're trying to move in in a more modern direction and the current engine uh, on the Unreal Three engine, which I think Rocket League is using, so I think the the Unreal Three engine supports newer 
direct or direct text implementations but it doesn't su- support the newer uh, implementation on the op- open standard side which would be going from OpenGL to Vulkan uh, I believe the newer Unreal Engine does but then they would have to rebase the entire game on a new engine which I d- you'd imagine would be quite an undertaking so uh, I, that's their reasoning from a technical point of view yeah I don't know I li- literally don't know anything about this uh, because I've never developed a game in my life, but uh, like you know, uh, what what can you do? You win some, you lose some, and I imagine it it hurts people who enjoy Rocket League and uh, like Linux. Uh, they uh, I think Epic offered DAM and Mac users as well refunds uh, for uh, f- because of this, but uh, you know, uh, what what can you do? But Good that uh, let's not end this on a downer. It's good that uh, Godo is getting a quarter a million dollars grant. Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> that's that's good. What what people forget, I guess, is that these companies are full of developers and tech guys, so they're bound to have a lot of Linux nerds in any given tech company. So I mean, it just makes it like even if it doesn't make them money, maybe a lot of companies are just happy to make a Linux version of their product because they just like Linux. And it doesn't cost them a lot of extra money to do it. So just yeah. my two cents. I wish that was a case in everything, but uh, developing for one platform is difficult and developing for across three quite different platforms is, is worse, you know. So, But I think there's a, there's a with the proliferation of uh, streaming, uh, you know, uh, today the news uh, is that... Uh, NVIDIA GeForce Online or whatever it's called. Do you know, guys? Uh, it basically, like their online streaming service is now open to public. It was in closed beta or, or something like that. Oh, I didn't so see that. So people can sign up for $5 a month or something like that. And it works with your Steam games and uh, some other sh- online, like gaming shop games as well. So with with this kind of things where where everything is happening on the server... And that's not just games, you know, like last time we talked about Canonical and Unbox and streaming applications to mobile phones. With this thing where everything is going to move on to the server backend and we will all just uh, have uh, client applications to to to, uh, to connect over low latency, high bandwidth network and uh, game or do whatever over the network... I think this operating system is going to become less important anyway. And hopefully that will just mean that you can run Linux and uh, your mates can run, I don't know, Xbox, and uh, you can all play together. Yeah, it'll all become agnostic eventually. And that's when I think Linux is poised to take over. Yeah, because we've got a server, bitch. Yeah, next up, we just wanted to give a mention to uh, Zoran Grid. Uh, Connor, you put that in. Yeah, and uh, on their website, and, and particularly their their name, that like Zorn Grid, almost sounds like the movie trailer. <laughs> so like it's on their website, it's like for the past ten years, Zorn OS has been given a new and better commuting experience for countless users around the world. In our next leap, we'll make it possible to bring advanced technology into the companies, schools, and organizations. This is our vision for the future of IT in the workplace. Ding, 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 ding. How much did they pay you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's 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 very much kind of sci-fi sounding Zorn Grid. So <laughs> that made me made me think about that. But essentially, what there is a it's a management um, front end uh, for a deployment for Zorn OS on on your computer. So if you have uh, 25 computers that you are running from a, a school or something like that that have all Zorn OS on it and then you have one web interface you'll be able to see okay that 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 the CPU is kind of running a bit hot on, on that computer I wonder what the processes are oh that that process is, is kind of running away with itself I'm going to kill that process and kind of remote management that's one kind of thing so that's their idea of getting into that space that uh, a lot of a uh, a lot of windows houses would be kind of used to that sort of thing that kind of r- remote management and deploying applications you could remote deploy applications you could f- delete applications um if you no longer want uh, pe- 
uh, your users to have access to certain applications. You can imagine it's 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 very powerful. So this is them kind of dipping their toes into into uh, this area, um, and I believe they have aspirations because uh, for it to run it for this to be distro agnostic. So the the this to run on different Linux distros as well. Uh, you imagine initially since Zorin OS is is based on Ubuntu. Um, that that would be more compatible with Ubuntu based distros, but I believe they do have aspirations to make it uh, distro agnostic. I applaud the effort. Uh, like this is something that Windows, as you said, have it. Chromebooks have it. I think it's possible with iOS, if uh, like on on iPads. And uh, the, the, what we can bring to the game is like, or what Zorin can help Linux bring to the game is obviously better optimization of hardware, more freedom, and, uh, you know, uh, not giving Google all your information or Apple all your money, right? So, uh, this is, a this is if they pull this off, this is obviously coming, they say, uh, coming this summer. If they pull this off and if it goes coming into this school, summer <laughs> yeah. if if they pull this off and if they if it uh, gets into the school and replaces uh, the likes of uh, chromebooks or i don't know windows installs and and ipads that would be that would be great because uh, one thing i think that linux is lacking is this kind of a gui based administration that uh, uh, that a lot of uh, windows uh, it admins are used to I mean, we have Yast, obviously, but uh, that's not that's nowhere near as uh, slick as what uh, the screenshots or the, the it's not screenshots of what the mockups look like. Yet. It does look really nice. Um, I actually, I I think I was telling you guys earlier in the week that I uh, I installed Zorin OS on my laptop, um, on my 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 ThinkPad, and uh, really impressed with it. Um. I actually paid for the ultimate license as well. The thir- I paid the thirty nine euro and got the uh, the full fat one, and uh, it is lovely and it runs so well. It runs very like it, the fan doesn't go at all on the laptop. Like it's it's super silent. It runs very smoothly. Looks very nice. Has a nice selection of apps. It's aces. Yeah, so for all you naysayers out there, we're actually not being paid by them. We're actually paying them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I gave I gave them money and advertising. Yeah, fan boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, we 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 are acquainted with uh, Artyom. I I can never know how to pronounce his name. Apologies if he's listening. <laughs> uh, Artyom Zorn, I yeah, believe. Obviously, we're. We have met him once or twice, we're acquainted with him, and he is a, a lovely fella. Stand-up guy. Who makes a great OS. <laughs> so, Mike, uh, WireGuard will be included in Kernel 5.6. Um, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, uh, it's good news for everybody of our listeners who use this, uh, our SIR coupon code. Uh-huh. Uh, but, uh, yeah, basically, WireGuard is the... Uh, is the protocol for VPN for virtual private networking uh, that's focused on simplicity. The code is so good that even Linus uh, liked it and it's going to be in the kernel near you depending on the distribution. If you are running Debian, you're probably getting in 10 years, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was a, I'm sorry, that was an unnecessary uh, slide at Debian. We all love Debian here. But uh, basically, yeah, in kernel 5.6, which we don't know when it's going to be released, uh, there's a wire guard will be included, and uh, that's good news for everybody who likes simple VPN because open VPN is getting a bit old in the tooth. And uh, this this is great news, especially in the age when privacy is uh, something that everyone has to fight for. And uh, obviously, I I'm not aware of the technical side from this, but um, from what I've been told, not only is it a simpler um, implementation of, of of connecting to a VPN on your Linux machine, but I believe it's actually actually more performant as well ver- uh, versus using uh open vpn so you um using open open vpn and the vpn provider if, uh, like it's uh wireguard is more performant on both sides so I, I believe it's a it's a all around better implementation of the vpn protocol again i'm probably talking out of my ass when it comes to te- te- this technical nature 
So uh, Thunderbird uh, has has undergone some uh, some changes under the hood. Um, so this is changes in organization. So a uh, brief history of Thunderbird. Uh, in the past five years, I believe, um, Thunderbird was uh, went from being under the Mozilla Corporation, which is the uh, entity that is behind Firefox. Um, it's a it's a for profit company, but it's under the umbrella of the foundation, which is the Mozilla uh, non profit uh, oversee uh, arm of it. Um, so then it was people would some people said that it, the Thunderbird was spin off spin off and put out to pasture because it went from uh the the Mozilla Corporation, which was the one that was making profit and so on, to the still being under the protection of Mozilla, but under the Mozilla Foundation. So that meant that uh, it was no longer going to mozilla.org and then slash Thunderbird. It was kind of uh, Thunderbird ha- was put out on its own, under its own URL and there was a big massive donations button at the top because obviously it was no longer under a for-profit entity um, and they were asking for, for it to be self-sustaining and donations and so on and so forth. Um it's actually donations have been coming in um, quite steadily and they've been able to hire um quite a number of people like five or six people full time so um i on the basis of that and there is a whole kind of energy behind it now and it's even it's a quite large task because you'd imagine thunderbird has been there for quite a while so mozilla have decided you know we're actually going to create a uh, something called MZLA, Mizzle Technologies. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it. Uh, that's my attempt at it anyway. Uh, Mizzle. Don't, conf- don't uh, confuse it with MRSA, MRSA. So <laughs> uh, technologies, which I believe is kind of its own kind of pro- for-profit thing that is f- for uh, Thunderbird specifically. So you'd have the Mozilla Corporation for Thunderbird or for Firefox and this new MZLA Technologies Corporation or whatever you want to call it for Thunderbird. So uh, hopefully this means that it's good news for Thunderbird and that more cash and more focus will be heading towards Thunderbird because Thunderbird is has quite a lot of uh, potential. It was just kind of... Uh, stagnated or for a very long time i keep thinking of uh sentences to make out of those letters mzla and i've come up with my zipper leans askew <laughs> that is way too much knowledge uh, <laughs> does it lead to left or right <laughs> my zipper <laughs> or lean, I, I, lean, zipper I know. The boys oh, no. Le- <laughs> leans a jar would be a better way of saying that um my zipper leans a jar yeah, that's what I'm calling it from now on. Uh, <laughs> well, it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's such a it's such a pleasing arrangement of letters that I see where they. <laughs> no, it is. Like, <laughs> pleasing isn't yeah, a creepy, sure. I mean, creepy uh, word. Like, um, I think I think we do them better service if we stop talking about the Mzla and start talking about the actual Thunderbird because <laughs> that is. Unlike the name, which I will have to get used to, uh, Thunderbird is a really good um, uh, email client and uh, personal information manager. Connor's recommended to me, obviously I've known about it before, but Connor's recommended it to me when he heard about my woes with uh, K-Mail, as I was on KD, I think that was when. And then, uh, really, it it uh, just keeps going with my massive... Uh, uh, with my massive company uh, company email account, which has got tons and tons of uh, emails in it, and uh, you know the, the the calendar is great. I'm using tasks. Uh, my com- my employer uh, runs infrastructure on Gmail, so I I use it with um, Google Tasks and Google Calendar, and it works. And it's uh, it's like near perfect, really. Uh, I'm not sure what development they do on it, but I don't know if it needs much. Like maybe it's matured that uh, to 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 a point that until unless something really 
happens with the email protocol or the calendar protocol that hope that it it's it looks basically as stable and finished to me honestly haven't used it in quite some time connor now the name uh, escapes me of their community manager so uh, ryan sipes ryan sipes that's the or one. or that guy as we called him if in one of our earliest podcasts because we couldn't figure remember his name <laughs> good memory Oh, like me, obviously. Uh, but Ryan Sipes uh, was on... Uh, was on... Uh, a looks co- for everyone? No, it was... Uh, he was on... Uh, it was, I was on... We listened to so many Linux podcasts that they all kind yeah. of merge into one another. So uh, apologies to the specific podcast that he was on. But he, he was on and it was a very interesting uh, episode. So if, if, when we figure it out, we'll put it into the show in notes. The show notes, yeah. Um, he teased that one one thing that they want to uh, implement or they have aspirations to implement is they currently uh, and it's in their current version I mean I, I bring, bring up Thunderbird at the moment and this functionality is there they have a chat button next to the right which is their compose for a new, a new message for compute for a new email and the chat is essentially an IRC client there um have plans to make that a a matrix client as well so essentially right within thunderbird click on chat and you have, you have access to matrix big and that is on the on the basis of the uh that mozilla are moving all their internal chat themselves their development chat and um, from irc over to matrix yeah, i mean yeah that's that's basically uh that's interesting because that means that something something is finally coming for IRC, which uh, I'm don't I'm, I don't like. Oh, by the way, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I found it. It was the Mike Dominic show, Mike Dominic of uh, former ra- Code Radio fame. Uh, That's had, true. Uh, yes, had Ryan Sipes on, and it was a really good. Uh, it was a really good discussion. So, uh, I will post obviously. The, we will put uh, the show note in the show notes a link to that uh, to that podcast. Uh, by the way. Uh, personal shout out um, the Mike Dominic show is uh, only just starting I think they are on their fifth or sixth episode and it's a really interesting show about uh, development uh, developers and uh, automation um, Mike is a funny guy um, by that I mean he's actually fun to listen to uh, who used to do uh, the Code Radio show with uh, Chris and later with Spain from Jupiter Broadcasting so yeah uh, Go head over there and uh, give it a listen. Next up, we've got uh, we've got a couple of shout outs here. Um, first up is one I put in there, uh, digitalsovereignty.org. Um, I'm not going to spell that because it would take too long. Uh, so we'll put a link in the show notes. So it's just like a, it's just a small blog that I found on the Binary Times. Um, not a huge site. I just like the idea. I like why they started the site. Um, it's only got a couple of posts right now, um, but I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, so it's a blog about digital freedoms, online privacy, you know, the, uh, the misuse of technology that we're seeing these days, um, which nobody can deny. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd recommend giving it a look. Maybe we'll get them a few extra views and we'll see what they write. Yeah. I have a shout out too. Uh, mine is, uh, Rofi, which is an application launcher that I've had when I read the, uh, when I, uh, did I, sorry, I'll start again. I have a shout out too. It's uh, Rofi, uh, which I heard about uh, in uh, regards to the aforementioned Regolith distro, who uses it as its own application launcher, a Windows switcher, and uh, SSH launcher, and much more. It includes a pass integration as well. I've switched to it from Dmenu. Dmenu is a f- great project, but uh, Rofi just captivated me with uh, like the themes and the way it works. Uh, I'll obviously put a link to the show notes and uh, anybody who is uh, who really likes uh, uh, launchers where you just start typing and things start appearing and you can select them with your keyboard, this is for you. Uh, it's R O F I, so uh, there's always confusion about. I'm not. I'm not saying that your pronunciation oh, yeah. is incorrect. Uh, I generally don't know. So it's like, is it a Ruffy? Is it Ro? Yeah, to be honest, Ro-fi? Ro-fi, it, That's cool. Uh, so is I, it, I, is I it, is it Ruffy? To be honest, 
I, I, I just I just look at it as I yeah, sure enough. Yeah. And I didn't even think about it. But yeah, looking back, you are right. It could be anything. Um probably there is a YouTube video if I found a YouTube video, but unless it's the actual inventor or the, the, the developers speaking about it, we can never be sure. It's it's almost ruffle. <laughs> ruffle hey, hey. <laughs> Rolling on floor, floor laughing. laughing. Insul- you mean insulted. rolling on the floor, launching apps, yeah. Rolling on floor, in- indigent. Indigent. <laughs> R- rolling on the floor, indecent. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Okay, go. let's uh, move on. I was trying to keep it classy, for fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> on, on this podcast, really? <laughs> well. Uh, well, that's... That is a good point and all, but anyway. Um, but uh, next up, events. Um, we've only got one event, and we usually have none, so that's an improvement. But uh, Fast Talk Live has been announced on 20th Woo-hoo! of June. And, Sorry, uh, I stepped on it. <laughs> and Joe, Pinky swears the date is final. Uh, we're not going to give him <laughs> shit about that because it seems very difficult and frustrating to organize, so... Yeah, I mean, Matt Probst, he's been doing it. This is his, this is going to be his fifth or uh, fifth first talk life, and is going from strength to strength. We can't wait to go. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's always it's always a great time. Uh, I, I it's genuinely it, it genuinely empowering. Um, well, uh, inspiring is the b- better word that I'm thinking of. Is to even just hanging out in the crowd I mean. Uh, the very first time that uh, I went along, I was just part of the audience. And then the second time we went along, or, uh, we were actually recording at it. So uh, it's it's kind of weird to be in the audience and then having been up on the stage and then going once once that that bit of the show was finished and then going into the audience. I was straight back into, hey, I'm just here kind of hanging out with the audience and people going up to me and says, that was really cool or that was really or I enjoyed that or whatever and I was like oh god I always nearly forgot that we were kind of up on stage and I just like it's it's because it's so it's so comfortable that you kind of you're you're just blending with with it and chatting away to people so there it's really kind of cool and relaxing and kind of a couple of beers and having fun while people are podcasting or so yeah very it's good really cool time. atmosphere so yeah, people pencil it in twentieth of June in uh, the Arison in central London, mate, and um, <laughs> yeah, put it you in the dailies. Mate. Yeah, listen, Governor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll be there in uh, in London on the twentieth of June. Um, so uh, we're gonna wrap this up mercifully. Um, the socials, uh, the usual. You know all about it by now. Go to Telegram, go to Twitter, fuck off, will you? Like <laughs> 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 Mastodon email show at linuxlads.com. Uh no donate please, at Linux please Lad. Do. Yeah, sure. We, we like we like getting your emails. Linux no, yeah, no one ever sends us emails. Linuxlads.com forward slash donate if you'd like to give us some money. Um sorry, I've probably I think I've been listening to too much blind boy, so I keep like cursing constantly through the parts that I shouldn't curse at. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so next week, um, Mike has a question for you all and we want some answers for next week. Yes, so the question for our audience is, uh, are you using Vim or are you doing it wrong? Uh, please email us your opinions uh, or Twitter them us to. No, uh, tweet tweet to us. us tweet them at us they, yeah. yeah one of those webs and one of those actions yeah. and or, or, uh, or share ma- it on mastodon, mastodon them mastodon us mastodon us yeah write it on a brick and send this through our windows whatever uh <laughs> some people might actually do that and careful. and mike's address is <laughs> <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, i genuinely don't know so that was a that was a false uh well threat. genuinely if anybody messes <laughs> i mean my my flat is quite uh Hi, so I I don't think uh, it would be quite a feat to 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 manage to smash our windows with a brick. Although I'm not, I shouldn't ask for it, should I? I mean, yeah, so people will take it as a challenge take up the now. Challenge. Yeah, well, yeah. So, so, I, I certainly will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that anyway. delinquent um, standing outside my window with a brick? Oh, it's just shade. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what does a hipster brick look like? <laughs> oh, oh, God. Def- well, it definitely has a beard anyway. I'm the token hipster. 
I feel so discriminated. Anyway, <laughs> I think that's all we have. I think that's all the listeners have the patience for. So <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Yeah. Oh, as usual, I've been Shane. I've been Connor. And I've been Mike. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.